Ornamental plants are very popular these days. You will see them everywhere. But what do I mean by ornamental plants? Basically the ones that are primarily grown for decorative purposes. Now for decoration you will see two kinds of plants. Either the ones that are grown for their foliage which is their leaf or for their flowers. So in this lesson we will cover the foliage plants and the flowering plants. For foliage plants I like to divide them into two categories depending on what kind of light is available in your space. First category I would like to talk about is brightly lit. Any space that is getting about 3 to 4 hours of direct sun, it could be indoors as well as outdoors. And the first plant that I highly recommend is a rubber plant. For the care of rubber plant, all that you have to do is water whenever the soil is dry, for which you do the sticky test, remember we spoke about that. And secondly, ensure that the light is good for this plant. If you want your rubber plant to grow rapidly, ensure that the sunlight should be at least 3 to 4 hours directly falling on the plant. The second plant that does brilliantly well in direct sunlight is aloe vera. Apart from the perfect decor piece for your windowsill, this plant also has great medicinal values. All that you have to do is chop off a leaf, split it open and you can use the gel for its medicinal properties for skin and scalp. My third recommendation for bright spaces is erica palm to add some tropical feel. Actually, with most bright spaces plant, the problem is that often people forget that too much of sun also burns your plant. So be very, very mindful that your plant is not burning in the noon sun. My fourth recommendation for brightly lit spaces is a fiddle leaf fig. Look at the beautiful broad leaves and it also has this waxy coating. For such broad leaf plant, you have to be careful. Spray water and clean them nicely with a cotton cloth. But let's say if you don't want to get such a big plant for your space, you want something very elegant, small for your work desk, which is in an area which is brightly lit, then my top recommendation for you is to get succulents. Succulent refers to any plant that stores water in them. Now, like aloe vera, when you split open the leaf of the sedum here, you will see a gel-like thing inside. This is an adaptation that plants growing in a desert area have. They try to store as much as water possible in them. Which also means that you have to be very careful on watering for these plants. Only water when you're completely sure that the soil has dried out. For that, for beginners, I would say it's okay to pull out the plant and see if the soil is wet or not. It, you know, nobody is born with a green thumb. It takes time to develop an intuition about your plants. So if you are a first time succulent parent and you're not sure when to water them, I highly, highly recommend pulling them out and check the soil, inspect it. For example, here it's still sticky, right? So I would wait for another three to four days before I add water to this plant. Now, since not everybody has a luxury of brightly lit space, for example, I stay in Mumbai and here having just a big window is a luxury. For people like me who live in small spaces, do not have a big bright window, you can choose medium to low light plants. For example, Monstera. Here I have two varieties of Monstera. This is Monstera Deliciosa and this is Monstera Atsunai. Actually, I don't want you to bother much about the scientific name. You know, as long as you know what your plant needs, you don't need to be trapped in the scientific names because they're complex and they make it complicated. All that you need to do is look at your plant. For example, this plant is broadly leafed. So we'll have to add water whenever the soil dries and also because the surface area is big, the rate of evaporation will be high for this plant. Therefore, we keep this plant in medium to low light so that the sun is not intense, reducing the rate of evaporation. For both these varieties, the care remains the same. The second plant for such light conditions that I recommend for you is Pothos. It's a wonderful plant for beginners. If you are a plant serial killer, this is one plant you should start with. Now, another thing that makes this plant interesting for me personally is that it's very easy to make babies out of this plant. All that you have to do is spot a node. Now, what is a node? Node is that junction from which you see another leaf coming out. So this is, let's say, the main stem. Here you see the leaf is coming out. You make a cut underneath. And this method works for most indoor plants or house plants. Now we put this in water. For any cutting to grow in water, all that you need is two to three healthy leaves. Now here I don't see a very good leaf, so I'll take another cutting. 
these two to three leaves will be enough for the plant to survive and you put it in water. In about seven to ten days from this junction, this node, you will see new roots coming out. Once you start seeing about an inch long root, you stick it into the soil. And in about a month, you will have a green and luscious pothos growing out of it. Now, if you want to add some color instead of just the boring green, well, it's not really boring, but if you want to add some color, I recommend red aglonema for you. There are two varieties of this plant, a green one and a red one. If you want to add some color, a red one is a great idea. A trick to keep these plants bright and red is ensure that the light that is falling on this plant is abundant. At least three to four hours of direct light, but not the noon sun. That will definitely kill that plant. Either keep it in morning sun or evening sun. Otherwise, just in a medium light space such as this space. But if you want to know plants that can grow in absolute low light, by which I mean where you would need an artificial light to even read a book, I have two recommendations for you. ZZ plant and a snake plant. Both of them do not require much care. Once in a while, if they start turning yellow, place them in a better light condition for two to three days and then you can move them back to a hallway or a bathroom where you do not get enough of light. For all these plants that I've mentioned in my list, the cutting method works for them. For example, here for the snake plant, you can snip a leaf. The interesting thing is that from a snake plant, you can have at least three to four cuttings. And you stick them into the soil. Because it's a hardy plant, it will take about a month or so to develop callus or to develop roots. And once it is rooted, you can continue in the small pot. Or if you want, you can also move to about a four to five inches deep pot, like here that we're using for aglonema. Now that we have covered the foliage plants, let's move on to flowers for decoration. It is important to note that there are two kinds of flowers that you would find, perennials and seasonals. Perennials are the flowers that will keep flowering for multiple years. They have a life cycle of more than two years or more than three to four seasons, I would say. The seasonals are the ones that live only for one season. Now, one season can be for a couple of months or even a year. First, let's talk about the perennials. So here we have a mogra. There is another kind of jasmine that grows very easily in any tropical condition. This is a crepe jasmine. Of course, they kind of look very different, but the main difference is that this jasmine does not have any smell. Otherwise, it's also a great plant to add to your garden. If you want to directly put in ground, you can do that. You can also grow them in five to six inch deep pot. Both of these plants will do well in these size plots. The second perennial that you can add for some fencing that can climb your fence is bougainvillea. There are a large variety of colors available in bougainvillea. And this will help also to add some height. Speaking about height, you would also need something on the floor. For the floor of your garden, you can bring in kalanchoes. They do not require any care. And when I say any care, I actually mean it. All that you have to do is keep a little control on watering. If you look at the leaves, they're waxy. And remember, we spoke about succulents. The plants that have this waxy coating are plants that cannot tolerate a lot of water. So you have to keep a control on watering, by which I mean water only when the soil is completely dry. Otherwise, you will not get a lot of flowers. And since we're talking about a lot of flowers, one trick that works for most flowering plants is that continue adding phosphorus in the soil. Why phosphorus? Because scientifically, we know that adding phosphorus helps plants to grow more flowers on them. Fourth perennial that you can grow in pots as well as in ground is hibiscus. Here you see actually a bud is about to bloom. There are a couple of other buds as well that are coming out. This is one plant that you can grow in medium to small size, but also in a huge size. It can actually reach up to the height of three to four feet and become much bushier. So when you're growing in the garden and if you want a bushy plant, put it directly in soil. The fifth perennial that I want to recommend for your garden is vinca. Now this is one plant, even if you kill it, it will come back to life. All that you have to do is water it appropriately. This plant also actively sends out seeds. You won't even realize, but 
within like two to three months, you would have lots of vinca growing in your garden. Therefore, I prefer to contain it within a pot. But if you do have a big garden, feel free to put a couple of seeds in the garden directly and in six to months, you have a heavy bush of vinca growing. In this plant, you also get a large variety of colors. Here we have a red and a pink one. My favorite is actually the white one, but you can grow any kinds of colors. The main difference that I personally find between the seasonal and the perennial flowers is this, that the seasonal ones are bigger in size, more attractive in color, but it's slightly difficult to care for. The first plant that I want to recommend in the seasonal category is petunia. I love how this plant looks. They're small in size, I like to start them from the seedling stage. So what I do is that I get from the garden center small saplings of this plant and then I put it in the pot, but you can also start them from the seeds. For all these seasonal flowers, one thing to worry about a little is that most of them will flower in the spring. Now the spring in India could be very different from the spring of North America because we get spring in somewhere February, March because the temperature is appropriate at that time and the Seasonal flowers like to flower in that temperature. But let's say if you are in North America, the spring might be slightly later than a tropical country. The spring in North American countries could be somewhere between April and May. You can time your seedlings and your seeds accordingly. You should start the seeds about two to three months before the spring. So here I have this petunia growing and this is a pink color. In this plant also you have a couple of colors. What I like to do for my balcony is put a bunch of them together and they will add some beautiful color. The second plant to add some color in your seasonals, Dahlia. This is actually Dahlia pinnata. This plant does not send out a lot of flowers, but whenever it does, the size of the bloom is huge and it's gorgeous in color. Third plant I recommend for beautiful colors is a daisy. For all these seasonal flowers, the care that I do is just to ensure that the watering is good. We follow the same foliage plant method. You put your finger, see the soil sticks to your finger or not. If it's not sticky, you add water to it. Here we go. And my last recommendation for your seasonal flower garden is a marigold. Marigold is my absolute favorite, not only for the aesthetics, but also for a functional value. It is very good in attracting pollinators, bees, wasps in your garden. When you're growing a large variety of vegetables, you can't go around hand pollinating them. To make the flower turn into a fruit, you would need pollinators like bees and wasps that will come and do the job of transferring the male pollen to the female parts. To keep your flowers happy and healthy, for care, you have to ensure that the soil is well draining, by which I mean that you can use the regular potting mix that we spoke about in lesson one. The light has to be good, direct sunlight, and you have to do something called deadheading. I'll show you what it means. Here I have this petunia, and you would see a couple of flowers are drooping and about to die. They have bloomed already. In this case, we pinch them off. Now why are we doing this? See, why does a plant send out flowers? It sends out flowers to form seeds and to carry forward its generation. But we are growing these flowers for the aesthetic value, for the decorative purposes. So we are going to make the plant save its energy. Instead of putting out that energy into forming seeds, it will send out more flowers. For all these flowers, seasonal or perennial, deadheading will work wonders. Now that we have gotten to know how to grow your flowers, let's move on to how to grow your own food.